Yeah. Uh, one of the other problems I see in the mountainous region is of what to do of the waste that's generated. So I think tourists need to be far more aware and that they need to pay the price of um, the environmental impact. I have switched to coming into the office on an electric bike, but whether that reduces carbon emissions that much, I don't think so. And if you talk to locals in the mountainous regions, they will tell you how much the snow has depleted over the years. Recently, that says actually the growth of renewables is really staggeringly high. Actually, it's quite a good news story. So there's no denying that um, warming is happening. So you've lived in Godavari for the last two and a half years? Yeah. So, of course, we're close to the forest, and that's a success story. Mm -hmm. So what was it in the 80s? That was degraded forest. And now it's pretty dense vegetation cover. So since I think the 90s, when the efforts were made to, to establish community forests and bring in all those various regulations with that. So now at least around the valley, you've got the forest, which is a fantastic success story. Mm. Um, because I compare that to East Africa, where similar approaches were being put into place, and community forestry just didn't didn't work. And it would be really interesting to understand why. How did it work here and not in in East Africa? But I think the drive for biomass as a fuel in East Africa was always much greater than here. I think the alternatives came in faster here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that is a success story that the the forest cover has resurged and come back, but then within the valley you've got very little vegetation left, and yeah, that presents some challenges. So how how was the seed of wanting to get in the frontier of environmental challenges of the world planted? Was there a particular instance? as a student maybe yeah i think it it emerged um probably when i was uh doing my studies and i think there were two elements that really struck me and one was the extreme inequities that were emerging between north and south mm -hmm. Um, as we called it at the time. Um, and this was particularly actually in the context of things such as access to pharmaceuticals and medicines and some of the um, really um, the poor practices by some of the large multinational firms, whether that was in the promotion of powdered milk for babies that was then not affordable. So the inequity was kind of my first point of contact um, and that's how I moved into the development sector but also doing geography uh, there was always an interplay with the the natural world and the whole issue around um, the biophysical and what was happening with the state of the environment and so those two elements came together for me um, and then I knew what I didn't want to do. So, <laughs> so when, when it came to the careers choices, they were saying, oh, you could do um, environmental engineering. And I went, oh, that sounds interesting. What's that? It's all about air conditioning. And I said, no. Went, oh, you could do retail management and go and work with Marks and Spencers in the UK. Went, no. And I knew what I didn't want to do. And so I, then I moved on to a master's. Of course, in those days, there were no environmental courses. I entered through geography, which is your classic kind of interdisciplinary subject, hence the connection between development and environment. And then I moved into land resource management. The, the environmental courses didn't exist there, but then, I mean, then after I finished, then we began to get more and more courses coming on stream. And then I was very fortunate during my master's to join a voluntary organization which 
which took me to Tanzania after my master's, where we worked on a water supply project for an agricultural school. So there I got a lot of exposure into some of the the really ground-based challenges of local communities and water and 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 so on. And also in the, even in those days, deforestation and how that was affecting the water supply. And so then it just moved on. <laughs> it it kind of went from one to the other. And then I got a another job back in Tanzania running a um an environmental program in dryland Tanzania, which brought in issues around health and sanitation, water, community forestry, agroforestry, um, working in a very difficult and challenging environment. So these were agro-pastoralists um, who were sedentarized, so they weren't moving. Um, but it, it was a difficult environment and very poor. And so I, I had a lot of exposure there as to what works, what doesn't work, working with local governments, working with communities. Mm -hmm. So you want to hear more? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I keep going? Okay. Yeah. How, how's the university life in Nottingham? How, how was it? Um, I mean, that was obviously university life was, was fantastic in those days. Um, yeah, I mean, in those days, you know, we we didn't have to self fund. So now my kids are going to university. It's 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 more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so they there's there's loans and and so on. Um, but the course was geography, and so I it was classic interdisciplinary interdisciplinary course. And but what's interesting is that. So my daughter thought she would do geography. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking at, at the courses and I was kind of quite disappointed as to how little innovation there is in some of the traditional universities. And so actually she's decided to go on, on a course that's more communications and sustainability. Um, but there's still not as many options as I thought there would be for someone, for a young person wanting to go in and really work at the heart of climate and sustainability. Um, so that was kind of surprising to me, although there are other innovations. So my son has decided to do chemistry and actually chemistry now has quite strong components with regard to energy efficiency, energy alternatives. Mm -hmm. So it's some of the other courses that have now picked up on some of these climate and environmental challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of environment, um, we've got a very cold winter this time in Kathmandu. Mm. And uh, there are some people who might say, ah, oh, it's so cold, what are you banging on about global warming? This is global cooling in some ways. I think there was yeah. a Republican senator in the United States of America who once took a ball of uh, snow inside a house and said, look, since we've got balls of snow, this is not global warming at all. Yeah. <laughs> How do you take a look at instances like that? So you have to distinguish between short-term occasional events and long-term trends. Mm -hmm. And what causes a period of colder weather or a period of heavier snowfall is quite complex. It's to, there's interlinkages between the physical system, the moisture in the atmosphere, the temperature that causes these short term events. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to recognize that the long term trend, um, where the data is categorical is one of warming. Mm -hmm. The science is there. The data is there. You can't dispute that data. So even I think a few weeks ago, WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, um, determined that 2023 is the hottest year on record mm -hmm, yeah. and that we're 1.47 degrees Yeah, there, there was a United States official who said that this is not the point of global warming, this is the point of global cooling. Sorry, global... I forgot what the phrase was. This is not... Um, 
the period of global warming, this is of global boiling. Yeah, I think that was exactly. his pronouncement. Yes, yes. So, and of course, for our region here, um, we are warming at two times faster than the global av average. In Nepal, that is. In the, across the Hindukush Himalaya, uh -huh. the third, or the third pole, as we call it. So the science is telling us that we're warming two times faster, which is similar to Antarctica, two times faster than the global average. Um, and the Arctic is warming four times faster than the global average. So, so the science is there. The data is there. Yes, there are some data gaps in mm -hmm, places. Mm -hmm. So there's no denying that, um, warming is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, but the consequences, of course, for this region as well as others is, is enormous. Um, I mean, we published a report last year. It's called the High Wise Report, mm -hmm. which demonstrates that we had much faster ice loss in the 2010s than the 2000s. So obviously we haven't done the 2020s yet because we're still in the 2020s, but we expect an even faster rate of ice loss in the 2020s. And this has enormous implications. And it's happening. We know it's happening. You see all those images of the glaciers and their retreat. So the implications on that, on biodiversity, on water flows, of course, water flows linked to snow, um, not just ice, ice loss, but the, the implications are huge. They say peak, peak water by 2050. 2050. Peak water. Well, when I was uh, living in a village that was just about two hours of walk from Namchi Bazaar, mm -hmm. you could see this uh, wonderful mountain that was known as Kumbiula, mm -hmm. and it was sacred for a lot of people. Yes. And when I talked to people there, they used to say that about a decade or so ago, it would be snow laden, and now it's just like mm -hmm. a black rock. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to locals in the mountainous regions, they will tell you yeah. how much the snow has depleted over the years. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I was also in Kumbu uh -huh. um, in November, and then we went to the Jigme Dorji National Park in September. Uh -huh. And once you get up to three and a half, four thousand, four thousand five hundred meters, you can see the signs of glacial retreat everywhere. Because, of course, you see the grey rock, you see mm -hmm. where the ice is now and where it may have been. Um, so, so these are like glacier graveyards. It's actually really sad to see it. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to one of the forest rangers in, in Jigme Dorji in National Park in Bhutan. And, and I asked him through a translator, what is the biggest change that he's seen whilst he's been working there? He's been working there for 15 years. And the first thing he said, rising snow lines. So it was quite interesting because it was not a planted question or anything. <laughs> he just, that was the first thing he said. Mm -hmm. And then we also met with a community and one of the chairs of one of the community committees um, said, well, I'm 70 and when I was a young boy, all those glaciers that you saw on that pass, that they were all glaciers not just piles of rock. Mm -hmm. So that's in the space of 50, 60 years. So yeah, the lo local people are the best evidence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that it's, it's changed substantially. I was reading through this uh, principle that's known as Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle as it's called. And in terms of uh, the climate uh, change denial movement, it's been said that it's only about 20% of the media that is mm -hmm. pewing out all the nonsense about climate uh, change mm -hmm. denial. Now, if we are to squash them, we would tread upon, uh, we would be stamping upon the freedom of speech or freedom of mm -hmm. expression. Do you think that there's, it, it's a very difficult thing to balance out these denialists without uh, curbing their rights to express what they want to? <laughs> <laughs> So I do think there's still more we could do in terms of communication mm -hmm. 
So a lot of the science is there. Um, a lot of it is really quite concerning, but sometimes we don't always get it out in a way and on a format that is more clearly understandable by a wider body. And I'm not mm -hmm. just talking about us here at ISIMOD, but this is a global issue in terms of how can we really get that science through? And that, that requires quite um, attuned advocacy, science, diplomacy mm -hmm. skills, and we don't all have those skills. So whether more and better communication can influence the denialists, I'm not sure, um, but it's worth a try. Mm -hmm. um, because maybe if there are more clear and coherent messages coming out, then actually it's harder to push back against those messages. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's that's one way we could do it. Um, I mean, it's a difficult question about curbing um, right freedom of speech, rights to freedom of speech. I suppose that's difficult of mm -hmm, coming from the yeah. UK. Um, we can't do that. Um, but there is the consideration about the global good and that if we continue to deny this and continue to let these processes run, actually many more people will suffer, mm -hmm. especially the poorest and most vulnerable. Um, I think looking at other policy and institutional mechanisms, sometimes the den there's a whole complex factor as to why denialists are denialists. Um, sometimes it's that exhaustion factor of, oh, everything's doom and gloom. Yes. And we need to get over that. We need to also be able to communicate the solutions and the positive um, ends of the stories, which is not always easy, but we have to focus on solutions and providing concrete options on the table, um, whilst also looking at how we can balance out these issues with the economic interests, um, which may make some of the denialists fear um, that any measures taken to curb emissions may actually impact back on the economy. And these are very difficult balances, and I don't think we've necessarily got all the solutions, mm -hmm. but I think we are seeing turning points. I think there's a report that was issued um, recently that says actually the growth of renewables is really staggeringly high. Actually, it's quite a good news story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that by 2026, it might be somewhere between 30 to 50% of our energy. Mm -hmm. So that that's a really good news story that we should focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also the biodegradable fuel used in the aviation industry. And uh, right now, the current market value is about 50 million or 100 million or so. And in the next seven to 10 years, it's been expected that that would grow. The figure would grow to around 800 million or so. Mm -hmm. If something like that happens, yeah, exactly. these are good signs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but um, there are a few people who while advocating for climate change, uh, do it uh, protest about uh, the use of fossil fuels in ways that are not necessarily good. Um, in Germany, I think that there were two words, uh, climate terrorist time, or they were known as climate terrorists. Mm -hmm. Or some people say that this is all mass hysteria, as you said, about the doomsday cult. Mm. And they had to unword these years. Every year in Germany, you have a word that's been unworded. Mm. Uh, there was one um, that was unworded around the 1990s, I think, and it was Oschlanderfrei, free of foreigners, uh, something quite similar mm. to what we saw during the First or the Second World War. Mm. And in order to get rid of these concepts, they tend to throw away these words, such as climate hysteria or uh, <clears throat> climate terrorism, things like that. Uh, I mean, I was once participating in... A march that took place, I think, a couple of months or so, a climate march that took place from Jaulakil uh, mm -hmm. to Baden. 
And in order to get to uh, the marching place, I had come in a motorbike. And I thought, this is, <laughs> this is me having it both ways. <laughs> and uh, even in COP28, uh, um, there was a report that was published which said that COP28 was the summit that produced the highest amount of carbon mm. footprint. And uh, it's, it's a very delicate balancing act. It's mm. quite difficult to have it both ways. Absolutely. Um, so I live here and I fly back to the UK. Mm -hmm. I fly for my job. Um, so what we're trying to do here is also create a climate and environment strategy so that we can have a better handle of our carbon emissions. Um, and we do what we can as a family, but it's it's difficult. There are hundreds of contradictions mm -hmm. um, in, in all that we do, and I'm very conscious of that. Um, small measures I do is like, do we really need to send that many people to our meeting? You know, we have to think about the economic cost as well as the carbon cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, the nature of our job necessitates travel. Um, so, so there are challenges, especially when we work across eight countries. Um, so you know, we try to minimize our plastic, mm -hmm. but are we good at that? Probably could do better. Mm -hmm. um, I keep saying we need to invest in a carbon offset scheme for our flights. Mm -hmm. That's my New Year's resolution for 24 that we have to do that. Um, we travel in a car. I have switched to coming into the office on an electric bike, ah. but whether that reduces carbon emissions that much, I don't think so, because the car has to travel anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but as I go on my electric bike, I realize that on that bike, I go as fast as the motorbikes, because it's a very efficient bike, it's got large wheels. And um, I kind of contemplate, think, wouldn't that be great if we could just get a better designed hybrid bike, motorbike? Um, but they're expensive. Mm -hmm. The electric bike is as expensive as a motorbike. Um, Sometimes more expensive than a motorbike. Yeah, exactly. Probably more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you can only travel with one person on a bike. You can't travel with three or four, which obviously motorbikes they use to carry more people. So, yeah. But could could we introduce electric motorbikes here? Could we get subsidies for that mm -hmm. somehow, somewhere from these global funds? I, because there's a so many win wins reducing diesel emissions and air pollution as well as reducing carbon emissions yeah but it's it's costly so if i bought my motorbike i'm not just going to switch that because of the cost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we need to somehow find a way of covering those extra costs yeah and what do you make of this <clears throat> global switch to electrical uh, vehicles as well not simply motorbikes but uh, the work that has been done outside to get more and more yeah. <clears throat> electrical cars into the equation. So it's a it's a midpoint solution, right? Because uh -huh. we know that you know we've got the, the we have to go to office and the rare minerals mm -hmm. and so on. Um, of course, Kathmandu is set up for people to travel in cars. Um, you can't cycle easily. I can't. I can understand why no one wants to cycle in Kathmandu. Um, it takes quite a lot of energy and and courage to do that. But then you take London, and you've got the public transport, and obviously vehicles don't go into the city centre unless mm -hmm. you're a resident there. So that has helped get people onto public transport and onto bicycles. And now electric bikes are very popular. And then there's various schemes that the government offers to part subsidize or at least offset the upfront cost of a new bicycle. Yeah, taking that forward here is, is, is quite a challenge. Um, 
So yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, riding in a bicycle here is extremely dangerous too. Uh, you have no idea when you're going to be hit over by a microbus or a bike because uh, they tend to frown upon, look down upon the people who are cycling, as opposed to in the West where, say, cyclers or pedestrians might be encouraged a bit more. So I think that it will take, yeah. take a mentality shift of some yeah. kind in order yeah. to get that thing rolling here. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Although there's some elements of road traffic that are safer here than in Europe. Yes. The speeds are slower. Mm -hmm. um, drivers do anticipate uh, errors. Um, so for having cycled in London in the 2000s, it's an aggressive, it's a much more aggressive driving style. Oh, okay. So, so, but there's been an enormous shift in the last 10 years with bike tracks to get people back on the roads. But there are many factors that have created that, mm -hmm. which included the terrorist attacks, included COVID and so on, and over-congested public transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you ever get a chance to take a look at how uh, the subject, such as environment, is taught across a country like ours? Have you had a chance to get into the academic side of it as well? Not so much, no. I mean, we work with quite a few academic institutions, but I do less on the curricula. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, although we have this Himalayan Universities Consortium and we house that here, and one of the founding ideas for it to come to ISIMAD was to use our science to to move into the curricula. Um, that's happened in a few instances, and but we really should be doing more of that. Um, so, I mean, the comment I would make is that any teaching needs to be very practical mm -hmm. and forward-looking, because as we're hurtling towards 1.5, the solutions of the last 20 years are not going to, to work. Mm -hmm. So really encouraging and motivating the young to be innovative and creative and forward-looking, thinking outside the box is going to be so important in, in any course that's, that's taught anywhere mm. in the world. Well, when I used to teach in a few schools um, back in the days, I thought that uh, environment science was one of uh, the subjects we could do away with <laughs> because the books were not written all that well. I mean, nobody has to go to a school to say that population comprises the sum of people living, living in a community. That, that is sort of uh, moving away from what should be taught. So in environment, you simply have definitions, such as what is the environment? Or what do you understand by deforestation? Instead of um, having data, maybe, real-life cases, scenarios, studies of uh, environmental desecration that has taken place. So I used to think, why is this book even here well, when you're not uh, giving anything of substance to students? And I think it would be better in our country if we could introduce a subject like that in maybe grade 11 or 12, because then there's a break. Say you study environment up to grade 10, and 11, 12, you have none of it. Mm -hmm. and then you've got the bachelor's program. Uh, one one subject during their high school might have done a bit of mm. good if it were, if it had all the guts in it, mm. without all the uh, without all the doomsays and that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you were talking about uh, how the subject such as environment was not present back in the day. Mm. Uh, would do you wish there was one? Maybe. <laughs> So I did geography and I, I chose that for a reason. And uh -huh. I still believe that geography is one of the best interdisciplinary courses that really looks at the nexus of multiple issues, including social, environmental, economic, um, including health dimensions. So through that degree, you really have to check address the complexity and interlinkages. So I don't regret going into a more uh, 
let's say, harder science degree um, because it, it gave me that more integrated perspective, which I think has been super essential for the for my career mm-hmm. and the places I've I've worked. Um, that said, um, I think we do need to integrate these issues across all subjects mm-hmm. um, because every subject has a dimension that is relevant mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to these issues. And um, we really need to get the young thinking about and acting on, on these issues uh, because it's their future. Um, and so even looking, say, at my, what my kids have learned at their school in the UK, um, not as much as I would have liked to have seen. It's only now as they're leaving the school that the school is saying, right, we're going to put solar panels on the, the, the roofs of the school. And we're, they've now introduced a kind of global awareness degree but it's not compulsory. So it's interesting that, you know, even in the UK, these courses are, these subjects are coming in, but not, they're not completely mainstream. Um, so you can probably come out of a law degree or an engineering degree without really having had to confront the, the whole issue of climate environment and development. Mm-hmm. And uh, since you've had a very colourful life in terms of uh, where you've worked, uh, you said that you worked in Colombo as well, in Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. How was the stay there? In terms of, yeah. <laughs> hot <laughs> in t- and humid. Mm-hmm, hot and humid. Um, so there I work for the International Water Management Institute, which again it operates ah. in the Global South. So. The program I run, ran was um, largely focused in Africa and South Asia. Um, so we didn't do so much within Sri Lanka itself. Um, but we looked at some of the issues around water, land, agriculture, um, and how you can create effective solutions to address the challenges facing smallholder farmers. Mm-hmm. So that is, I supported a program, I ran a program that was looking to develop solutions mm-hmm. in that space. So when you're looking, uh, looking at a country such as Sri Lanka, and you're taking a country like Nepal, and if you want to determine which of the two is more vulnerable to mm-hmm. climate changes, how would we do that? I mean, you've already said that in the third poll, we have uh, global warming that's, Mm -hmm. say, twice as fast as the average Mm -hmm. median or mean rate. Uh, So how do you cross-compare between countries, (laughs) or if it's doable? Yeah, it's it's not easy, but of course everything's interconnected. Mm -hmm. So when our ice melts, it eventually reaches the sea, and then Mm -hmm. you have sea level rise or destabilized ocean currents because you've got changing salinity levels which of course will affect um, islands like Sri Lanka but of course risk is a combination of vulnerability so the socioeconomic status of a country will determine its vulnerability Um, and then you look also at exposure So where are people living? Are they on the coast? Are they living in the valleys? And how many people are living in these more exposed environments? And generally, for instance, in islands, people will be living around the coast. Um, That tends to be where most populations are located in, in islands. So that results in a higher level of exposure. Um, Of course, here, Um, In the valleys, you tend to have the communities living not on the sides of the valley, but at at the bottom of the valley, so that results in exposure. But then you also have to understand the nature of the hazards. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you need to look at what kinds of hazards are facing a country like Sri Lanka versus the communities um, 
of the Hindu Kush Himalaya. And of course, here we have the Glacial Lake outburst floods. It's a seismic, it's an earthquake zone. Um, we have avalanches, mm -hmm. we have permafrost thaw. So there's a whole cornucopia of hazards here that you don't have at the same scale in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And that it, you could perhaps say, well, sea level rise is a longer run um, effect, whereas the hazards from the cryosphere are happening now. Um, so it's difficult, it's difficult, and it's difficult to compare, but there are some methods. Um, but also, like, in some areas, we say even we need to have more data, we need to have more understanding, we need to be able to monitor mm -hmm. these hazards. But even where we are monitoring them, it can still be very difficult to... To assess the risk. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the Sikkim disaster of 23 mm -hmm. in October, there was an early warning system that was oper operational, but for some reason it, it didn't give the warning of the, the landslide that happened that went into the lake that then caused the, the flood downstream that wiped out the hydro and killed over 100 people. Um, then we take Chamoli, the Chamoli disaster, where you had this enormous uh, mass of ice break off. So how do you monitor something like that? It's very difficult. Of course, that also, again, mm, wiped yeah. out billions of investment in hydro. So, so we do need better forecasting. Um, we do need better data, but... And, and so we do need to understand better where are the, the areas that are most at risk. Mm -hmm. That is, it's important to do that. We need to keep working at that. Hmm. Uh, I was, I was watching a comedian by the name of Owen Benjamin, and I think he's been barred from YouTube uh, about two or three years ago for being extremely anti-Semitic. And he was also a climate change uh, journalist. One of uh, one of the examples that he used to influence his audience was the following: He had a glass of water like that. He put it in an ice and said, "Look, right now the ice is starting to melt. Okay, but if the ice melts completely, the sea levels are not going to change. It, it just stays constant because the ice is lodged within the sea. It's, it's not going to rise that much." There's a very simple way that you could show that rising sea levels are not a threat. And I thought, oh, this is dangerous. This is potentially, not potentially, this is extremely dangerous because we have countries like Sri Lanka or Maldives where we have conferences uh, every year um, wanting to let people know that the country is in a grave danger. And we have people like that. And so how, how do we... Get rid of this nonsense as well. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can't. I mean, society is society, mm -hmm. and there will be differences of opinion. Um, the challenge is when that difference of that the opinion takes over. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to think that actually those denialists are not winning at the moment. Um, I think there is sufficient um, momentum, albeit slow, um, and recognition that things have to change. Um, so I think we're slowly gaining ground. Is it fast enough? Probably not. But these issues are complex, full of contradictions, mm -hmm. as you said earlier. Um, but also I'd say that a glass is completely different to the world's ocean. So again, a very easy way to counter that is to say, well, the ocean's far more complex. Um, it's not just about the sea level rise, but if you have a lot of fresh water going into the ocean from the poles, um, then you have changes in salinity that adjusts the ocean currents, which will have its own enormous effects. Um, so I think 
Storm in a teacup. Storm mm-hmm. in a cup. Um, yeah. I think it's hard to 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 counter those to to silence those voices. I don't think that's easy. Um, but then we have to come back with stronger arguments and more compelling arguments, but also solutions. We need to be coming up with effective, viable solutions that can balance these the economic, social, and environmental issues. Mm-hmm. So. Um... When you take a look at regions such as the Everest region or the Himalayas of our country, there is a growing concern that the pollution that's there mm. caused by mountaineers of leaving oxygen cylinders and um, packages of food, things like that. Uh, every year, I mean, there was a video that was released last year and uh, there was a climber who said, I can't believe the scale of this pollution. How how do we get around this problem? Because Nepal is very dependent, heavily dependent economically mm-hmm. on mountaineering. But we, I don't think, are seeing sustainable mountaineering mm. in some ways. <laughs> um, again, it's it's uh, it's something that does need resolution. But just to focus the fact that the Sagamatha Pollution Control Committee that was established, I think, yeah. about 30 years ago, have really been trying their utmost to address this issue. Um, and their, their efforts should be really applauded because they have have worked on fairly limited resources. resources. Um, and of course, now they've instituted the Carry Me Back scheme, which is, I think, quite groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. So there's some very interesting innovations and huge efforts. Apparently, there's actually 90 landfills all the way up to every space camp, um, and that the waste is managed. What else could be done? Um, Sustainable, recyclable cylinders. Yes. So I think tourists need to be far more aware Mm -hmm. and that they need to pay the price of um, the environmental impact is is one one perspective I have. Mm -hmm. Um, I think most tourists going up to Everest Base Camp are fairly wealthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a a one-in-a-lifetime kind of event for many people. So I, for instance, found that the fees were quite low in comparison to the rest of the cost. I think those fees could be nudged up gently um, to ensure that that there is that, but then to ensure that that funding goes back into environmental management. Mm -hmm. Um, There are other policy measures that could be instituted. we, for instance, took Puri tabs. I didn't let my son have a single plastic bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we could institute that at least for water because there's a lot of plastic bottled water going up there. Um, using Puri, Puri tabs are safe. It's what everyone used 20, 30 years ago. There are, but now there are innovations like you know, UV filters and mm-hmm. I hear that Annapurna, you don't there's no plastic bottled water mm-hmm. you can you fill up at these water stations. So surely Kumbu and Sagamatha could do that. I mean I, if I look back on some of my past experience Kenya has banned single use plastic bags oh, okay. several years ago. They've managed to sustain it. Everyone said it would be impossible. But they they sustained that ban, which was I think about ten years ago or more even. They've also banned any single use plastic in protected areas. Okay. So everyone said this would be impossible to do, but they've managed to do it. Now they still have challenges. I'm not saying that they don't have plastic waste challenges, but could something like that be instituted um, here? The challenge is, is the kinds of foods that mm-hmm. are brought up all got the wrappers. Yeah. And to a certain extent, that has to be the case. But could we look at which are the biggest 
culprits and how do you do ma- do you manage to reduce those mm-hmm. if not everything because we realistically you can't get rid of it all there was a sizable force behind this movement uh, of banning plastics in Kathmandu about seven or eight years ago when the earthquake came mm-hmm. about a week uh, before the disaster struck there was an announcement that we wouldn't be able to use plastics so when we went to meat vendors for example that wrap the meat up in mm. newspapers uh, as opposed to what is normally done in plastics mm. and i thought that this is going to get somewhere i never yeah. thought that uh, Kathmandu could be like this mm. they're finally doing something but then the earthquake came mm. just blew out of uh, all the water was spilled on the uh, yeah. idea of yeah. banning it so i think that it could have been done in kathmandu as well had yeah. had something like that not happened probably, probably. yes but uh, uh, the earthquake really... was an mm-hmm. enormous it was huge so you can understand of course kenya didn't have that mm-hmm. they managed to ban and it they didn't have a major event such a, as an earthquake but maybe it's something that could be revisited. But, mm. but Kenya started with single-use plastic bags. Ah. So I think you have to start with the easy wins, not everything overnight. It doesn't work to do everything overnight because we all want to have a Coke. I mean, we all drink out of these plastic bottles. Um, so you have to do the easy wins first. Something like plastic bags could could that. Is that possible? Probably, because there are easy alternatives. Mm-hmm. And then you start slowly, stage by stage. You can't just change everything overnight. No. Uh, one of the other problems I see in the mountainous region is of what to do with the waste that's generated. Uh, when I lived there, uh, most of it would be burned in open fields. Mm. And I saw that and I thought it was a terrible pity. Uh, if you walked around the region during the nights, I think in 15 days or so, there'd be, hu- con- there'd be a huge conflagration you could see from miles out. It would be as if uh, a volcano had gone. And I asked the locals, what is this? I have never seen it. And they said, no, this is we are uh, doing yeah. with our waste management system. This is the best practice that we have. And um, that also adds to uh, the whole problem of pollution in the Himalayas of our country. So maybe it's difficult to get all the recycling plants over there in order to install them. The society has got to be collectively conscious of it. Is, is this something that you've encountered? Maybe. Yes, I, I've seen a lot of plastic waste in the areas where I've visited. I haven't visited that many. Um, so I do see... Even on my cycle route back, I go through the back streets up to Godavari and I see, especially at this time of year, people are burning to keep warm. Um, And often you see a mix of wood and plastic and children sitting around the fire or women just burning and all the fumes are going straight into their lungs. And, of course, the health effects and the toxicity of those fumes is is really quite staggering. And, of course, there's no awareness of the health impacts. Um, So I see that even here. Um, how do you resolve that? I mean, one issue is education, awareness. Uh, I mean, if I flip back to my childhood, we had massive waste issues in the UK and there was all these campaigns of Keep Britain Tidy. There was this logo with a dustbin in someone's... Um, So, you know, it took probably 20 years. So we still have fly tipping and we still have problems. But here, in the mountain environment, it's really quite challenging. I mean, I think one one issue has to be reduce, um, reuse. 
I mean, even reduce, I mean, reduce has to be the first. Um, but how, you know, as peoples and societies get wealthier, they want to have the the more Western, the Cokes and the Seven Ups and so on, even though that isn't nutritionally the best thing. Um, so these are very difficult issues, actually. I don't have the solution. <laughs> but you know, could there be some sort of... You can't even get a recycling facility up. How do you get a recycling facility up to a mountain area? Could you use more glass, but glass is heavy? How can you carry glass up to these areas? Or could you have recycling points at specific small small hubs where you re you know you could refill with coke? I, I don't know. It's d difficult, difficult. It's very difficult because you, societies have the right to access these these products. But then there are consequences. We need biodegradable plastic. <laughs> that's, that's what we need. Well, I heard recently that the former Deputy Director General at Isimode was awarded the Padma Shri Award in India, I think. It was that's right, Eklabish. Eklabish, yeah. I wish something, something similar to you as well, so that you get a Victoria Cross on Sunday <laughs> 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 for the wonderful efforts that you've done. Mm. Uh, it's been delightful talking to you. Uh, one hour, uh, it was a seamless one hour, and it was really great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.